the greater than 99 consensus on human caused climate change in the peer reviewed scientific literature. I call this North Korean uh, consensus because in North Korea there are elections and the president gets 99.9% .9 of the votes. So this is a North Korea style uh, consensus. My guest today is Jonathan Duby. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm a professor of uh, chemistry at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, uh, talking to you in Israel, and I hope we won't get any disruptions. I'm actually a theoretical physicist by training. I did my a, a PhD in theoretical physics, and then spent a few years as a postdoc in the United States, and then came back to Israel. I've been a professor since 2012. And I'm going to say a little bit about why I'm talking about what I'm talking about today. So the, the, the presentation I'm, I'm giving is called Biases in the Knowledge System from Academia to the Public and Back. Um, it, it actually came about from a conference we had in Israel, which was named Perils to Academia in the Western World. And... I think many of the viewers will actually feel connected to this uh, a notion that there is some peril, there are some perils to academia in the Western world. Not everything is uh, great. However, before I start the main topic, uh, um, I of course want to address the current situation in Israel. So, so let me give you a quick update on what's going on, and then hopefully we can carry on without interruption. So. As many of you might know, on the 7th of October, uh, uh, the terrorist group called Hamas carried out a very brutal attack against civilians, well-documented crimes against humanity, atrocities, which I can say have only been seen before on the Eastern Front during World War II. And they've taken over 200 people hostages, among them documented 40 children and infants. This is just unbelievable and their status is unknown to date. No Red Cross or anything like that were allowed to visit the, these captives. So Israel had no option but to eliminate Hamas in what I would call a denazification campaign, as simple as that. The war can only end the way World War II ended. That's the only option. Hamas is no more and leaders and commanders dead or brought to time. That's the goal. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is the world's best and documented record in preventing civilian casualties. It was inspected by NATO and by the American Armed Forces and so on. We continue this policy. There is no intention for anyone to be harmed except the Hamas leaders. However, as President Biden acknowledged, there are casualties of war. I wish there were no casualties of wars among civilians, but there are. The best way to avoid unnecessary casualties is to demand that Hamas lay down their arms and surrender. That's the fastest and easiest way to end this conflict, because that's the only end result that Israel can build. So I don't want to make this into a political a, a thing, because none of what I said here is, politi is, is politics. It's just good against bad. It's, it's good against evil. And if you have second thoughts about which side you're on, you really need to think deeply about this situation. And that's all I'm going to say about this, and hopefully we will not be interrupted. So thank you for that. And back to the story of uh, biases in the knowledge system. So uh, um, this is uh, a talk about what I would call uh, practical epistemology. Epistemology is, is the study of understanding. It's a, a branch in philosophy. And this is practical or applied epistemology because I want to really ask the question of how do we know things. So uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction about how I got into this thing. I mean, my research in on the daily life is what we call non-equilibrium nanoscale systems such as very small systems, which you interrupt in some ways. And, and these are three examples, a molecule that you put between two metallic electrodes or nanoparticles where you shine light on or a, a small photosynthetic cells, which you excite in some way. These are the things that I study 
in my everyday life as a scientist. And I think it may be a trait of character, but many of my papers are in a way go against the stream. I have a habit, which is, you know, some would say unfortunate, but just it turns out that I uh, am, am very cautious about my science. So I, in many cases, write things which are not typically accepted. I even have uh, this guy, William of Ockham, appearing at uh, one of our uh, scientific uh, papers because we use Ockham's razor as an argument. So my, my kind of natural... A, a tendency is skeptical, even in my hard scientific work. I'm also a prominent Israeli skeptical skeptic about climate change, and this has made me quite a persona in Israel, and so much so that in uh, December 2022, a um, member of the Israeli Knesset, this is the Israeli parliament, Alon Tal, and I were invited to give a talk, to give talks in the same conference, and Alon Tal uh, um, canceled his uh, appearance just because I was there and wrote in his uh, Twitter account, I find this to be absolutely unacceptable. Analogous to having a Holocaust denial in a conference on Europe and during, during World War II, you have to uninvite Jonathan Dubin to this gathering. So I've made quite a name for myself as a climate skeptic. And, and you can see I have a, 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 a few podcasts and, and uh, most of them in Hebrew. And the third uh, 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 point of this triangle is that in the last three years, I have been teaching a course on the philosophy of science and on what makes a good scientist and what's the, you know, the boundary between critical thinking and, uh, um, and scientific progress. Because, of course, if you criticize everything, you cannot have any progress, right? You will not pass year one. So there is a boundary there. And I've been teaching a course about this in the last three years. So all of these have accumulated into the story that I want to talk about today, which is actually written in a paper which was recently published in a journal called uh, European Reviews, and this was peer-reviewed. But of course, it's, it's a paper in sociology or in epistemology. It's not a scientific paper. So the start is uh, this picture. This is Ben-Gurion University, it's my beautiful campus. It's about an hour drive um, uh, south of, Berche, of Tel Aviv. Israel is very small. All universities are about an hour drive from Tel Aviv. And uh, you can see the university. And of course, I've been in university for many, many years. And I was actually um, a child growing up in the university because my father was a professor of nuclear engineering at the same university where I now uh, reside. And I remember as a young kid, I, I, I used to walk on the streets and one day I came to my father and I told him, Dad, what do you do all day? You know, because he was, you know, sitting there looking at papers, doing calculations. And I, as a young kid, you don't really understand what this place is. So I asked him and he was very serious. And he told me, look, the university is a place that accumulates knowledge. Okay. So I asked, how does it accumulate knowledge? So he gave this answer and he was very serious about it. He says, look, when students come to the university, they know very little. When they leave the university, they know nothing at all. The data was accumulated by the university. <laughs> of course. And that, that's, a, that, that's my father was a funny guy. And, and it took me a long time to try to understand what it is that universities actually do. And I think uh, um, until I finally got it, and then it turned out it was actually written because my university has a document which is called the Ethical Code of Ben-Gurion University. And the first line of the Ethical Code of Ben-Gurion University has in it the telos of the university, the general aim, 
What is this place here for? And they write it very beautifully. The fundamental aim of a university is to seek, investigate, and teach the truth, to promote all fields of knowledge and scholarship, and to develop cultural, intellectual, creative, and critical activity within the university and in the wider society that it serves. But really, the first sentence is great. The fundamental aim is to seek, investigate, and teach the truth. Now, uh, you see, two things here are important, truth and knowledge, right? There are, uh, these are tangible things. It's hard to understand what they are. So uh, what is the truth? And there are various definitions, and, and you can think about different disciplines of science as providing different uh, definitions of truth. In mathematics, a truth is just a statement that comes out of the axioms, right? That's a very easy definition. That's why people who are very ordered are very comfortable in mathematics because they have a very clear definition of what is true. In physics, a uh, truth is something slightly different. It's a statement that reflects observations, right? If uh, someone in the audience is familiar with uh, Spinoza's writing, then Spinoza, the famous uh, 17th century uh, uh, Jewish philosopher, talked about facci naturae, the face of nature, right? What we see is true because it's out there, right? And the true statement just reflects that observation. So that gives you a definition of truth in physics. And of course, it's very interesting to understand that a theory, right? And I'm a theorist by, by training and, and thinking. A theoretical uh, statement can never be true. Only observations are true. Um, and this has been, you know, people have been debating about this uh, thing for a long time. I don't want to go too much into that story, but we kind of understand what, what I mean. Of course, the hard thing is how do we know if something is true? And here I borrow from a very uh, uh, beautiful, uh, um, I actually steal from a uh, um, YouTube lecture from a, a professor called Michael McBride from Yale, who teaches organic chemistry. But in his first lecture, he talks about how do we know stuff. And we basically divide knowing into four ways of knowing. The first way is that we were lucky enough to be told something by the divine, right? If, God himself told you something, then you know it's true. However, that's very rare, right? It doesn't happen a lot, right? It, you know, very few people that I know are actually given knowledge from the divine. So that's pretty rare. But there is a second step to that. Of course, we can gain knowledge from the authority, right? The guy who got the knowledge from the divine can give it to us. And of course, you can generalize knowledge from authority to anyone who speaks with authority. Of course, these two ways of knowing are completely useless to the scientific method, right? Because the scientific method tries to tell us something about the natural world, the world around us. And so mm -hmm. these two methods cannot be contradicted against the world around us. So they are hardly use, useful. But we do have two ways which are very useful and they make essentially the scientific method. So one way is knowledge by observation. We just look at things and then we know they are there. This is an, uh, an example from uh, one of the students in my department called Miran. And he's observing nanoscale structures in the electron microscope. So he knows that they are there and he can manipulate them and he knows what they will do. So knowledge from observation is very, very important. And there is a beautiful story uh, about uh, um, Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday is probably one of the greatest uh, uh, chemists or physicists of the uh, 19th century. And it turns out that, that in his memoirs, he reflects upon a book he read when he was 14. He was, of course, he did not go to school. He was a bookbinder's apprentice. And he happened to stumble upon a book 
and, and which was written by J.N. Comstock. In fact, it was not written by J.N. Comstock. It was stolen by Mr. Comstock from a book written in England by a lady called Mrs. Marset. And she wrote a textbook on chemistry for young girls. True story. And this is what he writes. It's very beautiful. He says, I, was, I had a very lively imagination person. I could believe in Arabian Nights as early as it is in the encyclopedia. But facts were important to me. I could trust a fact and always cross-examine an assertion. So when I questioned Mrs. Marset's book by such little experiments that I could find the means to perform. So he saw a fact written in the book and he tested it by observation. That's the making of a great science, scientist, right? By confronting data, or confronting a statement with observation from the natural. And that's a great way of knowing. And then right, I think that I have got hold of an anchor in chemical knowledge. That's very, I think that's a beautiful summary of what observation means. And of course, the third way of, the fourth way of knowing is using logic. Right? We know things because they make sense to us. This is an example uh, uh, for my uh, office. These are my two students, a student and a postdoc, trying to make a logical argument to some effect. And at this point, I had no idea what they're talking about because the logic they had to explain, explain it to me at some point. Now, a lot of people are, uh, uh, don't understand why we use, for example, mathematics in a theoretical physics. And the reason is because mathematics is a very easy way to uh, uh, define the logical statements that we have, just because of the structure of mathematics. Because in theoretical physics, all we use is logical arguments to explain a, a physical observations. So if you want a, a short summary of the, the essential philosophy of science, is that the scientific method of inquiry is based on the never ending circle of observation. The observe, after we, we observe something, we use logic to come up with a thesis, right? Then we use logic to say, okay, this thesis will give us some prediction to some observation about the natural world. And then we test it again with observation. And then we are either corroborate the prediction, or we falsify. If we falsify it, we throw away the thesis and we come up with a new one. Of course, it's easier said than done. Even hardcore physics are not as easy as that. And of course, uh, um, the lower you uh, uh, go, or, or the softer the science is, the harder it is to use this never ending circle. I mean, if you think like many of the people here are acquainted with climate science, right? It's very, very hard to make, a, to use this circle in a strong way because we don't really have, for example, we can, don't have a way to manipulate uh, experiments in climate science. And that's very, very hard. So I, uh, uh, in my uh, uh, teaching, I use something which I call the Popperian ladder. So Popper argued that the best science is a science where you can falsify a, a, an argument or falsify a thesis. And then you can rank all the, the sciences according to how hard it is to falsify a statement. So mathematics is at the top because it's very easy. Just give a counter example and you falsify the statement. Physics is slightly lower in the ladder. Chemistry, then biology, then maybe uh, economy, climate science, and then psychology and history and things like that. Now, I like this idea because it's very uh, useful. And I always tell my students that this is not a moral statement. It's not that history is less important than physics. It's just that it's harder in psychology or in history to falsify a statement. And when you study or when you do research in these kind of uh, um, um, uh, disciplines, you need to be aware of that. However, everything I said so far 
is relevant to the ivory tower in academia. But the world goes way beyond the ivory tower of academia. And so the question that I would like to pose is not how do scientists know things? I think we kind of answered that question. And uh, um, of course, there are many we can, I, I can talk for hours and hours on end on each slide that I just gave, but I want to ask a more general question. How do we, the people, know things? How do the public get to know things which have some level of scientific knowledge in them? Which in today's world is essentially everything. Because everything you read about in the newspaper, or everything you talk about, people are starting to say, oh yes, but scientists did this, scientists did that, right? It's, science is almost everywhere. We have become a very heavily scientific uh, um, society, especially in the Western world. So how do we know things? And the first step is to read uh, Alex Epstein's uh, book, a, a fossil future. And I think you should have him on your uh, podcast. I hope you will, because he's an amazing speaker and a very bright uh, philosopher. And in his book, he talks about the knowledge system, which is a very, very nice idea. And, and Epstein uh, uh, says like this, look, if we think about how the public gets to know things, there is a knowledge system and it's comprised of four steps. The first steps are the researchers themselves. They learn things using the scientific methodology, each in his own discipline. And kind of in the spirit of what we discussed in the first part of the uh, uh, presentation. Then there is the next step, right? The next step is synthesizers. Synthesizers are groups of people or individuals which kind of summarize knowledge in a specific area. And of course, one can give many, many examples. In climate science, of course, the most easy example is uh, the IPCC reports, right? So the IPCC is a synthesizer. They don't do the research. They just accumulate the knowledge and kind of write it by themselves. And then there are the disseminators. These are the institutions which take the knowledge from the synthesizers or sometimes from the researchers themselves and disseminate it to the public. And these are news outlets or maybe spokespersons or what other forms of media, and you are a disseminator and I am now a disseminator, right? And everyone who takes a, a knowledge which has been synthesized or generated by the researchers and brings it out there to the public to consume. And then there's a fourth step, which are the evaluators. The evaluators are the people who have, what should we do with, these, with this knowledge? And of course, the simplest example are uh, politicians, right? Or advisors or committees or things like that, which take the knowledge typically accumulated from the disseminators and talk about it. And uh, Epstein kind of imagines a linear system and it takes a, 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 a very deep effort in explaining the flaws in each one of the steps. And of course, uh, let me uh, uh, briefly summarize what he says. What he says is, look, every step of the system is flawed by definition because every step of the way there are different incentives which might harm the purity of a, a, the knowledge which eventually reaches the public. So if we talk about researchers, there are a huge number of incentives, which I'm you know, very well aware of being one myself. And one, there's always academic pressure you want to publish things, you want to get promoted. There is peer pressure, right? You don't want to annoy your peers too much. There is political bias, even in physics. People might be surprised, but even in physics, there, are, there is 
a bias that just comes from your political views or, or you know, your health views. There are uh, pressures which come from funding and from status. And I will, of course, give a few examples of each of those as we go on. Synthesizers, of course, have their own uh, uh, incentives. First of all, they are limited by the knowledge accumulated by the researchers. So if there was a bias by the researchers, this, will, this bias will go on. There is, of course, political, political bias. There is public attention. Synthesizers typically want public attention. And there is a beautiful or, or well, a, a clear bias, which is typically never thought of, which is the self-preservation of synthesizers. And of course, the clear example is, again, the IPCC report. Imagine that the first IPCC report would come to the conclusion that there is no climate change induced by uh, human emissions of CO2, and that there, uh, there is no point in going on for another assessment report. Can you imagine something like this happening? Of course not, because committees and synthesizers want to uh, 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 preserve themselves and to go on synthesizing. And it's just a bias. Now, I will say this a few times. These are not, uh, it's, I'm not saying that someone is doing something on purpose or someone is being evil or there is a conspiracy. It's just biases due to the fact that these people are just well, human beings and they are subjected to biases and uh, uh, incentives. Of course, the disseminators have their own set of, of uh, biases, political, a, a politics and agenda and financial incentives. And I will give, of course, a few examples. And the evaluators also have uh, their own a, a politics and agenda. And of course, populism, of course, thinking about democracy, there is a huge bias or a huge incentive for politicians to be reelected. And this is a feature of democracy. Right? It's not, it's not a bug. So, and this leads to various biases and incentives, for example, to populism. Now, what Epstein says that it, Epstein uh, uh, um, kind of gave a few examples, and it, and, but he focused on the problems of each and every step in the, in the way. For example, he's looking at the IPCC report, and he says, look, they wrote a whole report about the effects of climate change and didn't mention even at one point that the data clearly shows that human deaths, which is, I would say, the strongest uh, a characteristic of a, of a crisis, right? If you have a climate crisis, what's the worst thing that can happen is that people will die. That specific trait of the crisis has been diminishing amazingly in the last 120 years. And, and this is just nominal, right? This is the number of deaths as a function of year, and this is nominal value. Now think about the fact that from the 1920s to 2020s, the population on the earth is almost quadru uh, tripled. So in, in, in percentages, it's a huge a, a drastic reduction. And never it is reported in the IPCC. Same goes to the fact that indeed maybe climate deaths related to heat go up a little bit because of you know whatever temperature is increasing globally, but way 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 more people around the globe are die from cold weather rather than from heat. And this is a well known and well studied. Uh, 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 statistics in the Western world, about five times more in the third world, about 20 times more people die from a, a suboptimal cold weather than from hot weather. And this is the way well that. And this is never mentioned in the IPCC report, which clearly points to a flaw in uh, this synthesizer. And let me give a few examples about uh, problems in the disseminators. I want to give uh, two examples. One is from the Israeli uh, uh, media. So forgive me all those who do not read the Hebrew, which is probably everyone listening to you. So I will tell you. So 
This is a title from one of Israel's largest economical uh, 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 newspapers. And it writes here like this, the Wiseman Institute, double comma, like a research coming from the Wiseman Institute, climate change is happening faster than predicted, right? Of course, there is a rush to it and, and you know, you're alarmed. And then there is like a subtitle, Dr. Ray Chemke, which did the research, decision makers much, uh, uh, must, uh, uh, must uh, uh, make the policy understanding that changes are must, much faster than we thought. Of course, being a scientist, I went to look at what research they're talking about. So it turns about that this research talks about this paper, and everyone can read it. It's uh, in Nature Climate Change. It's called The Intensification of Winter Mid Latitude Storm Packs in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is the story in two words. In the, in the last you know, 25 to 30 years, there has been an effect which is unknown. Uh, the reason is unknown. There is something called a, a, a winter storms, and they have gradually shifted from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. So there has been a reduction of mid-latitude uh, winter storms in the northern hemisphere, and an increase in the same in the uh, southern hemisphere by about 12%. So overall, around the globe, no, no uh, measurable change but a, a shift to the Southern Hemisphere. So what this group did is, and, and, and this is a, a well-known, and um, so this is what they write about the a weakening in the Northern Hemisphere, well-known effect. And this is what they do. They take the best uh, models uh, for climate, these I, uh, uh, I think models, uh, intercomparison climate uh, uh, models, which are used in the IPCC uh, assessment report six, they plug everything they can into uh, their model, and they see that instead of a 12% change, they only see 4% change. So they write in the paper, the inability of climate models to actually capture the storm track intensification which delays the detection, questions the skills of climate models to actually assess the future changes in the Southern Hemisphere external focus. So the a paper, the, the scientific paper says, look, our climate models are terrible at this. However, what the paper took about it, what the disseminators took about it is, oh, climate crisis is happening faster than expected. No, it's not, it's just happening. And our computational abilities are poor. They don't, they don't capture what we observe. There's a completely different statement. Of course, one can you know, think what was the incentive to write such a terrible thing. Let me give you a very, very well-known example. This is New York Times. Uh, um, uh, New York Times, what is all to Pakistan? Now, one third underwater, September 3rd, 2022, there was a terrible flood in Pakistan. And it turned out outlets like New York Times, New Euro News, CNN, BBC, all right, wow, one third of the country underwater. Now, you don't have to be a professor of geography to understand that Pakistan is a really, really big place and no way one third of it is underwater and it turns out that only six percent of pakistan was flooded it, it was still a terrible flood it was really important i mean it was really a horrific effect but it's not one third it's five or six percent big difference and the writers in New York Times, all they needed to do was Google the damn thing. Right? It's very easy to actually know the real data. The second thing they missed is that monsoon rays in Pakistan have been diminishing in strength and flow ever since the 90s. And there are 
many, many scientific papers about this. This is a well-known fact. So how can you blame the climate crisis to this terrible thing if monsoons have been reducing in magnitude and slope rather than increasing in the last 30? So you must understand that there is some incentives here. And we can all play the game. Pick your favorite uh, um, element in the uh, in Alex Epstein's chain of a uh, knowledge system and think about the incentives and shows it. What I would like to uh, uh, say in the last 10 or 20 minutes is that Alex missed something and he missed two inherent flaws, which are always there in the knowledge system, which he did not discuss. One of them is that biases accumulate and this is an exponential effect. And I will give an example. So of course, if you have a bias here in the research, it will be reflected in the synthesizers and then it will be enhanced through the disseminators and then it will be even more enhanced through the evaluators. So there's clear accumulation of bias. And the second thing is that the knowledge system is non-linear. It's actually not a linear system it's a, a, a loop which has feedbacks and a, a, a internal interplay between the two. Of course, for example, research and synthesizers are the same people. Of course, they will interplay between two. Researchers sometimes talk to journalists. And of course, synthesizers and researchers get their fundings from evaluators, which depend on disseminators to get the popular vote. So it's a complicated nonlinear feedback system. And through that system, we, the public, learn things. And all these biases affect what we know. And I will give a few examples, okay? So from evaluators and to researchers, and this is the case for funding for climate research. We all know that in 1988, there was a big hullabaloo where a uh, Jim Hansen gave the famous uh, 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 testimony uh, in Congress. And look what happened to funding uh, through the 90s and 2000s for climate research. It exploded. And funding in the Western world for sciences comes only from government. So this is a clear uh, uh, motion from decision makers to climate science. Okay, now one would say, okay, it might be fine and it might be. It's just an indication that when you have funding, you will get more and more people to work on a specific subject. Okay, and this is the proof of that. If you look at the number of scientific papers and the, not, and the number of journals which are devoted to climate change, in the last 20 years, you see an exponential rise. Why is that? That's because the government is pouring money. And this money has to go somewhere. So departments are hiring more faculty. Faculty gets more funding to do the research. Of course, that research must be on man-made climate change, right? Because otherwise they won't get any funding. And that funding, we, you know, it has to be published somewhere. So more and more journals are, public, are uh, uh, being opened. And now these journals, sometimes you have to pay to publish them. So you pay to publish in journals, and then you get these citations, and then you write a grant and you say, oh, look, I have so many publications, give us more money. And you see this exponential rise. And this is the feedback loops. Now, the amazing thing that every scientist in the room knows what I'm talking about. It's not a secret. It's an inherent flaw in a publicly funded scientific uh, uh, discipline. And it's interesting that in the last 100 years or so, mainly after World War II, two, most of funding in the world has been, in the Western world, has been funded by governments. But now in the last 20 or 30 years, we see two 
interesting fields where a, a funding is not mainly, or well, science is not mainly funded by governments. One is pharmaceuticals, but that's a different story. And the other is AI. AI, or the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning, is mainly funded or it mainly happens outside universities. I mean, if you think about physicists or chemists, one would brag, I'm a professor in a university, and I also work for Dow Chemicals, giving them, you know, consulting or something like that. In the field of AI, people will say, yes, I work for Google or Amazon, and I'm also a professor at MIT. It's kind of the other way around, because most of research actually happens in big tech. So that's an interesting thing, and that's, but that's the, the, the exception that proves the rule. Um, yeah, okay, that's kind of the same, uh, uh, the number of papers, uh, uh, and this is as a function of what happens when, when the assessment papers of the IPCC go, uh, get published, and you see a beautiful increase from uh, AR3 to AR4, boom, an increase in funding, uh, you need to compare it to see here, boom, an increase in funding and an increase in the number of a uh, journal paper. There's a very, very strong correlation. Now, one of the key things, sorry, one of the key things that the public hears is consensus. What is consensus? Consensus is what do majority of the people think? Majority of the scientists think, right? Now, you might not know this, but in medicine, consensus opinion is actually a tool to assess the value of, um, of a treatment. Because sometimes it's a useful tool because you go to doctors which practice medicine, you know, as a family physician or something like that, and you ask 10,000 doctors, and they have been using a specific method of treatment, and they give you an opinion, and you kind of gather the statistics. And in things like medicine, it's been it's a well-known practice. And of course, you can argue what is the usefulness of such a practice, or what are the limitations of such a practice. And in medical uh, profession, it's well known that it must first, that, that any treatment must first be at least proven or just proven not to do harm by clinical trials and, you know, FDA regulations and things like that. And, you know, we can argue about the quality of those, but at least there is a methodology and, and consensus uh, opinions are the last resort. However, as again, many of our, your viewers will know, in climate, the consensus has become the tool of knowing the truth, of knowing what is right. And uh, I'd like to talk about this a little bit because we just published a paper and I, I, you know, I want to publish ourselves a little bit and brag about it. So in the field of climate science, there are two central consensus studies, one by uh, John Cook et al. from uh, um, for Australia, uh, and uh, they published the famous 97 a percent consensus study in 2013. And then another paper in from Lina Setor from Cornell who published the paper called The Greater Than 99 Consensus on Human-Caused Climate Change in the Peer-Reviewed Scientific Literature. I call this North Korean uh, consensus because in North Korea there are elections and the president gets 99.9% .9 of the votes. So this is a North Korea style uh, consensus. And of course, these, these consensus statements have been, uh, uh, been accepted as truth. If you want, this is a clear example of a knowledge from authority. In this case, authority of a, a majority. And these are just two very, very famous examples. The Guardian writes, case closed. Now look, they are 99% of scientists, all scientists in the world, agree that climate emergency 
called by humans. So already we see the biases in the uh, uh, disseminators coming from an already biased paper. And of course, at the bottom left, President Barack Obama, guys, climate debate is set and climate change is a fact. Although none of these consensus statements argued is climate change a fact or not. None of them ask that question. And this is kind of what we wrote in the paper that we just published. It was published in the journal Climate. Here is the link and anyone can contact me and, and I will be glad to send them the paper, but it's, it's open source and anyone can see it. This is actually becoming a very good uh, journal. And this paper has went to three rounds of referee reports uh, uh, with four different uh, reviewers overall. And it's a bunch of uh, uh, people coming from uh, physics, chemistry, computer science departments here in Israel. And we kind of work together to, to think about these consensus study because this kind of North Korean consensus doesn't make sense, right? I mean, people still argue about the ratio of the uh, uh, mass of the electron to its uh, charge, but you cannot argue about uh, in climate science, doesn't make sense. And then we make three basic statements. One thing is that in all these uh, uh, consensus studies, but specifically in the paper by Linda Sedol, they make sure that the hypothesis is very blurred. What is the opposite? When you make a, a, a statement, right, about science, it has to be very, very specific, quantitative. For example, a quantitative statement would be man-made CO2 emissions cause more than half of the, of the global warming observed since the 1950s. That's a quantifiable statement. And then you can, you can say I agree or disagree somewhat or not. That's very easy to understand. However, in this paper, papers, and I, 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 I invite the, the, the viewers and listeners to check us. They don't state what is the consensual statement. They just say man-made global warming or man is affecting climate or man is causing climate change. These kind of glory things. And then they have, so that's one thing. And of course they make it, nothing is accidental. And then what they did, they scanned random 3000 papers, but they did not read the whole paper. They read the abstracts and then they rated the abstracts according to different criteria. Are they explicitly quantitatively supporting the hypothesis? Are they supporting it non-qualitatively? Are they implicitly supporting? Maybe they, are non they have a no position about it or uncertain, or do they ex implicitly reject the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis? They explicitly reject without classification or explicitly reject and say, no, 99% of the warming is a natural cause. And out of the 3,000, 2,104 of the papers they scanned, reading only the abstracts, are neutral. They either have no position and uncertain. And then they say the most amazing thing. Let's add the total number of papers which were explicitly in favor, explicitly in favor without quantification and kind of implicitly in favor, that's about 890 something, add to them 2,104, that's about, you know, 2,870 something, divide that with 3,000, you get 99%. And the reason they do that, and that's written in the paper, is the following. We assume that papers which are either have no position or uncertain endorse the hypothesis because that's the consensus. I kid you not. That's written in the paper in so many words. And what we did was amazingly simple. What we did, of course, that's a, that's a clear, you know, a, a, false argument, right? Because you don't know what these guys are thinking. And what we did is the following. We took 
50 skeptical papers. These are papers which were written by well-known, outspoken, skeptic scientists. We take, you know, a, a Professor Willie Soon and uh, Rick Lindsay and Bill Happer and various other very prominent, very outspoken skeptics. And we take 50 papers, which we know, and we read the whole paper, and we know that these are skeptic papers. And then we rate them according to the Linus methodology. And we find that more than 50 of those would actually be rated as either supporting the consensus or uncertain, which tells you that the rating system is ridiculous. And we kind of argue why this happens. It happens because people who write the papers want their papers to be published. So in the abstract, we tend not to write something which will annoy the referees. So there's no point in writing, uh, and by the way, we don't think humans are causing climate change. Right? If the, if the referees got it from the paper, great. If not, also great. In fact, our paper has, starts with this. Anthropogenic activity is considered the central diver as current climate change. So if it would be a, a rated according to Linus et al., it would actually be endorsed and counted as endorsing the climate consensus. That's how silly their rating system is. So you can all read about this. And I want to tell a story and then we go on to the, to the last story that I have. So I want to, to kind of wrap the whole thing in a fictional story, which we all could understand might make sense. Okay? And this is the story about bare feet. I invented this story, it's not real, but it makes the point. It turns out that there is an, an interesting research relating walking bare feet, bare foot without shoes and uh, heart attacks. It's not real. I, I, I'm reminding the, 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 the viewers, I'm making this up, right? It's just a story. But think about it. Maybe uh, 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 um, walking bare feet is good for your heart. You know, there might be various uh, uh, research to that. Now, research in medicine is complicated, right? The body is a complicated thing. So some, uh, 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 some studies show very clear uh, uh, correlation between walking bare feet and less uh, uh, cardiac arrest or something like that. And some studies do not, about 70, 30, right? So, and that's the standard consensus. 70% of the researchers think, okay, maybe to some extent walking bare feet is good for your heart. And 30% would say, that ah, doesn't make any difference, right? Okay, that's roughly a reasonable number. Now, um, um, the Department of Health makes a huge report about cardiac health issues, right? To the minister, right? This is the synthesizer, right? And they form a committee. Now, even if they would form a random committee, the committee had has 70% chance of being in the, uh, in the, in the consensus, just because the, the, there is 70% consensus. Of course, clearly it's better than that because if you want to write about something, you would choose someone to say this has an effect because otherwise the chapter would be very, very short, right? I mean, it's no point writing a chapter that says, ah, there is no effect of walking there. It's all, the actual number of choosing someone who is within the majority is closer to 100%. Now, he would write, and maybe if he's honest, he would say, you know, the consensus is 70-30. Maybe he doesn't know all the uh, uh, opponents. Maybe he would write 80-20. But okay, that, that, the statement would be, you know, fairly scientifically accurate. Now, of course, there is a synthesizing, there's the, the report, 
and the summary of the report falls into the hand of a journalist. Of course, the journalist reads the report, he calls the head of the department, the head of the committee, and he tells them, tell me the story, it isn't well, this evidence well, that isn't. And what about those opposing? And, and you know, what's not the head of the committee says, yeah, there are some people, but they're not serious scientists. They're only 20 percent. They come from, you know, tier three universities and so on. And it's not that he's doing something wrong. It's just the way conversations with journalists go. And I've done a few of those myself. They squeeze what they want to hear out of. Now, the journalist will write a, 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 a piece in the New York Times. And of course, he will not state it the statistical consensus and evidence for that bare feet is good for you. No. The title of the piece would be The Dangers of Walking with Your Shoes On. Right? That's not going to happen. Because he wants, he, he wants people to read his story. And then the Minister of Health read, gets them document. Of course, the document is 26,000 pages long. He's never going to read it. What he's going to do is read the reference in the New York Times. And how far are we from the government issuing a law that we all must walk bare feet an hour a day? Right? Of course, this is a satirical story. But think about it deeply. It's all the time. It's always happening. It's just out there. And that's because of the way the knowledge system works. No, everyone is doing their jobs. And maybe all of them are honest uh, people. And yet, the system is flawed. I, I, I want to, uh, uh, I have about 10 more minutes. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Great. Okay. So, um, I want to finish up with this document. I don't know if all the viewers know it. It's a very important document which we must all know. There is a document by UNESCO. UNESCO is the arm of the UN devoted to uh, education, science, and uh, uh, development. And it has something called the 2030 Agenda, which lists uh, uh, something called SDG, Sustainable and Development Goals, which every uh, one in the world related to uh, education, science, and, and things like that has to endorse. Of course, what are these goals? Everything that is good, no poverty, zero hunger, equality in education, gender equality, reduced inequalities, clean water, climate action, everything which is good on earth. Of course, some of these uh, uh, goals uh, um, kind of uh, 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 interfere with each other, but I want to go deeper because based on the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals of UNESCO, they wrote a paper, uh, um, a, a paper uh, stating what should higher education uh, um, uh, institutes do? And this is uh, uh, the, the, the report. Everyone can read it. It's online. It's out there. And it's called Knowledge-Driven Actions, Transforming Higher Education for Global Sustainability. And this is what they write. And I want to rem remind the viewers of where we started. We started with what is the telos of the universities? What is the goal? The goal is to learn, study, and teach the truth, right? And this is what they write. And, and, and this is what UNESCO writes, right? Higher education institutions need to use the knowledge they produce and their education of new professionals. So students are no longer people seeking knowledge, they are now new professionals, to help solve some of the world's greatest problems as addressed by the SDG goals set out by the UN. So universities are no longer agents of truth. They are now agents to solve the problems 
that the UN decided are important. Clearly stated. And now, it's also time for higher education institutions to make sustainability and SDG literacy core requisites for all faculty members of students. So if you're studying uh, physics or mathematics, you must also learn about gender equality and climate change and indigenous knowledge, because these are core SDG uh, uh, objectives. So now the UN is telling universities not, all, not only what is the truth, or, and, but which truth to teach. The core of this report is to make universities and higher education institutes to play an active part in the agenda. So universities are no longer institutes devoted for the seeking and learning the truth, but to take an active part in an agenda. Unbelievably straightforward. And, and here's an amazing thing. H higher education institutes should not cease to protect and expand academic freedom for the promotion of systemic change. Listen to this. Basic and curiosity-driven research should also be maintained as a core principle when relevant. And who will determine where is it relevant? Aha! Higher Education Institute should consider establishing the post of Chief Sustainability or SDG Officers or Sustainability Committee at the top level to decide whether my research uh, um, is in line with the core principles of SDG. In the Soviet Union, they had a name for those. They were called commissars. Now, higher education institute must refuse to engage in research that's supposed to support non-sustainable practice. For example, study which is related to any way to the fossil fuel industry. This is a real danger to the academic world as we understand. And we think that, I mean, we're laughing the two of us, I can see, I don't know if the audience can see you laughing because it's unbelievable, but it is almost here. Here is a title from, to, from a, a last year. Since 2024, all students at the University of Barcelona, regardless of what they are learning, will learn about climate change. And who will set the curriculum for the climate crisis? Who do you think? Will it be Rick Clinton or will it be Michael Mann? Right? It's, it's a disgrace to the idea of scientific inquiry and academic freedom. And it's a real danger. And this has only been allowed because we did not understand and we did not appreciate the problems and the flaws which are inherent to the modern knowledge system. We woke up too late. And we must pull ourselves together. As I'm talking about everyone listening to this uh, uh, talk. So what can we do, right? First of all, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware about the flaws in the knowledge system, even when it's work working perfectly well. We need to be aware about our old flaws and biases and about other flaws and biases of every step of the ways and about the different feedbacks which are possible, right? We need to actively Pursue correcting these flaws, whatever way we can. And for that, science literacy is a must. And I specifically talk about science literacy at the uh, middle school and high school levels, where even in Israel, which is considered a fairly well a, a scientific country, science literacy is disgraceful. Students know how to solve problems but they don't understand what science really means. And it's easy to explain it to them. I do it a lot, even with middle school students. You need to start at early age to explain what science really is and what it isn't. 
And what are the limitations of the scientific uh, uh, method? Now, there are different layers of what can be done on the personal level. Guys, studying philosophy of science, it actually helps to become a better sci scientist or better uh, 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 um, advocate of science. Discuss it and be aware of your own science. It made me a better scientist for sure. At the institutional level, many of your viewers who actually work at universities organize resistance. Okay, this is like the conference where I first gave this talk, right? Debate, participate, argue at committees, argue at Senate hearings or university Senate meetings, object vocally. I can only give the example of the University of Chicago. And uh, uh, the University of Chicago is really a beacon of a uh, um, or, or a beacon of how free inquiry should actually be uh, done. So I encourage everyone to learn what is the Chicago trifecta and what is the Calvin report, which guides how the University of Chicago treats a, 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 this kind of politicization of the university. And the hardest thing is at the national and global level. How do we do it on a uh, a global level or national level, it's very hard. Participate in discussions and fundings, participate in political discussions, engage in global discussions like what I'm doing now, and object vocally through papers and what, it's very hard. Yes, I know, but we must do it. I want to finish a, a, with a quote from this guy. This is a, a, I, Dwight Eisenhower. A, one of probably the architects of the victory of the Allied forces in World War II, then became a very successful president. And in his a, a last public speech, his a, a final speech to the American people, which is a very known speech, he wrote, and the speech is very well known because they introduced what is now known as the military industrial complex. So that's a very well known a, a, a point in this, but he also had another point, which is slightly well known. And he writes like this In this technological revolution, he's talking about after World War II, so the 50 or the six, this is 62, a, a science becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steady increase in share is conducted by federal government. And he writes Today, the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop, a, a, um, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing teams. The free universities, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discoveries, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge cost in sports, and we've seen the rise of costs, for example, in climate research, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholar by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and gravely be regarded. That's one side of the feedback loop that government will decide or will affect what students become. But Eisenhower was an extremely smart person. And he realized even then, 40 years or 60 years ago, that this is a feedback loop. He says, there is an equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become a captive of the scientific technological elite. This is an amazingly deep understanding of the feedback loop which surrounds the way science is conducted and integrated uh, through uh, uh, our society. And I think we all need to think about that. And this is a good way, I think, to finish. So this is where I'll stop. All right. Uh, I just have a couple questions for you here. I'm just looking yeah, at your looking at your 99% paper, and it says you work at the Department of Chemistry in the School for Sustainability and Climate Change. I was surprised yes. to see that part of it. How How is well, that going over? Oh, well, I have... Uh, so, of course, like every university, we have a school of sustainability and climate change, which is really a pipe to uh, convert a, a national funding into local funding. And they sent out an email 
would you like to be part of this school? And if you do, send us some papers about it. And I said, yes, I want to be part of the school. And I sent a few papers I have about the physics and efficiency of, of solar panels, because that's part of my research. And I got in. So I'm actually part of the school. And there's been some pushback from the community. How is it that such you know, a climate denier is part of our school? But I, I, they just, I mean, it would be, there's nothing they can do about it, right? <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm part of it because I do study, I research about climate change and, you know, things related to it. I study the efficiency of solar panels, study the physics of solar panels, and I study the public perception of climate science, right? I just showed a paper about this. So it's, I'm actually part of that school and it's actually very fun. Yes, I agree. <laughs> do you feel like you, you are alone as a climate realist in academia over in uh, Israel or do you have any other support? Uh, uh, no, no, we have, uh, so Israel in general is, is slightly more uh, liberal than I would say what's going on in, in, in Europe and the US right now. So of course, within the school for climate change, I'm a blasting minority. However, throughout the, the Faculty of Natural Sciences, I'm definitely not a minority. And there are many, many proponent scientists which are, you know, probably worse skeptics than I, Neil Shaviv, which uh, 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 you had here is, is, you know, a very prominent figure. But there are other, Nathan Pando and, and, and many, many others. So Israel is a, is a more, is a milder, environment and actually people say yeah what you're saying it makes a lot of sense to us i didn't go deep into uh, the topic i see that a lot in the natural in faculty of natural science so actually i would say i'm i'm not a i'm not a blasting minority on that side of the campus of course if you go to the faculty of uh, literature and the faculty of sociology and psychology of course then it's like everywhere in the rest of the Okay. Uh, do you have any connection with a journalist? Uh, her name is Efret Fenningson. She's going to be on my podcast in a few weeks. Oh, yes, I do. I know her very well. She's a good friend. Yes. She's okay. going, oh, you're going to, yes, she's a, she's a very, very smart lady and a very sharp a, a journalist. Listen carefully to what she has to say. I don't agree with everything she says, and I had quite a few heated discussions with her, but that's fine. You know, uh, not agreeing on everything should be part of the culture of, of exchanging ideas. Absolutely. Do you have any connection to any other uh, climate skeptic organizations like Clintel or, uh, you know, well, GWPS? I signed, I, 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 we are now starting to do that, starting to form, I would say, the Israeli branch of Clintel. We have something called the Israeli Forum for Rational Environmentalism, but it's not yet a substantiated NGO, and we would like to expand it, but as you know, things in Israel are now in a halt. But uh, I think this new publication uh, uh, about the, the, the consensus study will really, I hope it will be a, a stepping stone to actually uh, uh, doing something like that. And you know, I, we, we have a bunch of Israelis signed the, the Clinton petition, and, and I would hope they would make us a branch. And the Israeli branch of Clinton, that would be uh, wonderful. Yeah. And you have been giving some uh, public talks. I saw you on YouTube giving at least one. Is that something you plan to do more of? Uh, well, as often as, can, as I can be invited. That's why I was so glad that you gave me the opportunity to come here. And because I, um, I feel, we have, I, I feel, you know, I have things to say. And I would definitely want to become, you know, a part of the global discussion. Especially now that Israel is in the spotlight and we are starting to see that everything is connected. I, I mean, people, I, 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 I talk a lot uh, with, you know, climate, uh, um, climate activists in Israel. Many of them are my friends and, and, you know, we have interesting discussions. Some of them are, are you know, very ugly opponents. We, you've seen the, the, the statement by Alon Tal. But some of them are good friends of mine, and we have active discussions. And they were appalled to see that Greta Thunberg, for example, is endorsing Hamas. 
an ad hoc state organization. Same with Michael Mann. Same with um, uh, Antonio Guterres. Same with Naomi Oreskes and all these, you know, prominent climate figures, climate activists. And I told them, look, it's not surprising at all because this progressive woke structure is the same in every topic. It's a construct, it's an intellectual construct where facts and the scientific methodology, methodology are discarded towards a theory where you can feel morally superior and virtuous towards yourself. And that doesn't matter if you're talking about the Israel-Gaza conflict, which is a conflict between good and evil, or if you're talking about climate science, or if you're talking about whatever, everything else. That's the essential construct of the woke, uh, uh, um, I would say, intellectual surrounding. And, and it's the same people, the same construct. So to me, it was not a surprise at all. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, anything else that I should ask you that I forgot to ask you before we go ahead and finish this one up? Uh, no, I think we got it all covered. I'm, I, I, I invite everyone to contact me directly. You know, just Google my name, and and I'd let, if there is some question that comes up, I would answer quite happily. Okay. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. I think it's a treat that I get to uh, to be involved in this myself because uh, this is uh, this is fun for me. This is I'm learning a lot from people like you. So thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank All you. Right. It was my pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Okay. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye bye.